Um, for those that don't know, my name is Cade, one of the leaders here at Divergent. Uh, I brought Harry with me. Harry's from Queanbeyan. If you want to get to know Harry, he's a good man. Uh, last week, if you weren't here um, at, at our one gathering, we had Josh all the way from Turkey, um, who we'll be sharing next week as well at City PM. Uh, introduce the series for this next few weeks, uh, and the series was Dwell. And the heart of this series uh, is to understand that God dwells with us. God dwells with us. And and he continued this kind of theme on Wednesday. So Wednesday we had All In, where all our gatherings came together on a Wednesday. And what he talked about, and I really liked what he was talking about, how God is trying to restore Eden. And so he, he drew a bit of a graph how, you know, God created the perfect world, which was the Garden of Eden. Um, sin distorted that. Uh, but God's heart that one day he will fully restore Eden again. Um, and in the, in, the, in the middle of that, there is a temporary Eden going on. And that is Israel, which we see in the old covenant. And now in the new covenant, the church is to represent this temporary Eden. Obviously, we're not the perfect Eden, as we still have sin and brokenness. But one day God will fully restore this. And Josh has asked me to, to speak on um, today was, was dwelling under God's sovereignty. So dwelling under um, his, his rule. And, and I've been just thinking a lot about what Josh said on Wednesday, um, how we all desire to be in Eden. Uh, he didn't really expand on this, but I was just been thinking about it and, and I just feel like God's been speaking to me about it over this week. Uh, and it comes out of Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 where it says, God has set eternity on the human heart. Eternity we can also transfer as Eden because that's what eternity will be, uh, this restored Eden. And um, yeah, if we look over history, understanding that the human heart has this desire for Eden. It has this desire to have this. And you can see this throughout history. And in fact, there is a museum dedicated to the Eden experiment. And none of you would have been alive at, at this time when this happened. Um, if, you are, if you were, well, geez, you're looking good. Uh, but this was around the 60s. And what took place was on the North Shore called the Taylor Camp. And this camp was a community of hippies and surfers and um, Vietnam vets and what they did is they lived together naked and in tree houses. Now, maybe you've heard of this. And this was their ultimate fantasy. And their ultimate fantasy was that they were living free without a care in the world. So there was no nine to five, no working. Now, I just want to point here. I, I actually, in my opinion, I believe that in the new Eden, in the restored Eden, there will be work. Because what we see was Adam was working before the fall. Um, a lot of Christians think that we shouldn't, you know, actually, if you look at the studies and research, um, when people retire, uh, the, the rise of depression and the, the rise of death, actually, after, and I'm sure Pete's nodding his head, so he's giving me a thumbs up. Um, so I actually think we were, we actually created to work. That's why actually God doesn't like laziness. It's actually a sin. Um, there, you know, this is a place where they had no mortgages, no bills, no worries. Uh, they lived in the tropics, so it was just perfect temperature all the time. Uh, live off the land. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You know, it's a, it's a, it was, sounds like a great idea. Uh, the other thing they added to that, they could have sex whenever they wanted. And they got high whenever they wanted. What do you think came out of this? <laughs> AIDS. AIDS was, and AIDS was only one part of it. Uh, actually, many became addicted to drugs and actually many died over overdoses because of the addiction. Um, you know, that, so drug abuse, sexual foraging, these were all deeply damaging things that came out of this community. Um, and doesn't this what humanity does? They try, they're trying to create this, this perfect Eden. I'll give you another example. I think, I think you'll find throughout history, as you think about it, there are so many examples of people trying to create their own Eden. Another example would be Chairman Mao of China. And uh, what he tried to do was 
tried to create this communist movement, which again sounds sounds good, doesn't it? it it's a, a system where everyone's equal. It's a classless society. People get equal rights, and and no one owns property. And you know what? When he first came up with this idea and was sharing this, you know he had so many supporters. Rolling Stones, John Lennon were full supporters of Chairman Mao, but we all know now from history that didn't work out too well. Under his regime, 40 to 80 million people died. I mean, you could also claim Hitler for trying to make his own Eden. He wanted to create a master race, which he believed was the Aryan race. And so, um, because he believed that they were the perfect race. And so, you know, we, we know that he exterminated the Jews. That was what he was trying to do. But Hitler was also trying to get rid of the society of dis- disabilities and um, handicaps uh, because he was trying to create this perfect Eden, which is even funny because he himself wasn't actually part of the Aryan race. And I could continue to go on. There are many more examples throughout history of people trying to create their own Eden. And I think we sometimes can look back on history and, th- and point the finger and say, I would never do that. But what you need to understand, when these things come out, people, when they heard it, and I'm sure when you hear those things, if I didn't tell you who, who those people were and you know, trying to create these societies, it's easy to get drawn in. You know, there were many under Hitler's regime that really trust and believed in him until it was towards the end and when they saw the destruction. Um, and the reason why I say this, because we can f- easily fall into these Eden attempts in our society today. You know, Jesus warns us in Matthew 24, verse 4, he says, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and they will deceive many. I don't know about you, but I actually haven't heard many say they were the Messiah. As in, I am the Messiah. Many have probably said that I will lead you out or um, I will be your saviour. And that, that is probably the same word for Messiah. But with what Jesus says here is that there will be many. He's saying that there will be lots of them trying to deceive us because we have this desire for Eden and we can be easily deceived by these false saviors, false governments, false expressions of the kingdom, these false Edens and we need to be careful like Jesus warns that we don't get sucked in. Now I was thinking about this, what would be the Eden of our culture today? And as I was thinking about it, and I, I, I actually had come across um, an article the other day, uh, but I think a potential Eden for us today that, that the world is trying to create is this pursuit of happiness. I want you to think about this. You know, the thinking that as long as you're happy, that's all that matters. And what we see is a government, and we're talking more about the West here, we see a government trying to create an Eden where everyone is happy. Can you see that? Can you see our government trying to do that? Trying to make a place where everyone's happy? And I I read an interesting secular study the other day that uh, I was sharing about um, how Western cultures, such as us, as Australia, US, Canada... Um, France and Germany, why depression is more prevalent in these cultures. And I found it very interesting. And this is what this study showed, is that where depression was the highest, there was also a very high value on happiness. It's interesting. And so what, what they did in this study, this study, they selected 100 participants that passed uh, for clinical depression and, and through observation, what they did over a month, they got them to journal and, and fill out these questionnaires and how they came to this conclusion is that when they read their journals and, and, and these, um, gone through these questionnaires, they found that 
the participants felt this social pressure of having to be happy, um, which was con contributing to their symptoms of depression. For example, this push for happiness on social media, uh, billboards, television, and so forth. And so these, these people decided to, to test this theory. You know, they heard this, they saw this and go, okay, let's actually test this. Let's actually put them in a scenario uh, to see if this would cause their depression to be worse. And so what they did, they created two rooms. And they put these 100 participants through these two rooms. And, it, and these two rooms were different. And they didn't tell them. They didn't know what was going on. They just told them that you've got to rock up to these rooms and we're going to put you through some tests. Anyways, in one room, they had happy paraphernalia all through the room. So they had happy quotes, happy posters, uh, books that were on happiness. In this other room, they had nothing, just a table and a chair. Pretty boring. And, and they put people through these rooms, many, uh, these 100 participants, and they would put them through these tasks, put them through anagrams. And, and, and what they didn't tell them was that some of these uh, were actually unsolvable, these anagrams, and some of these tasks that they had to do. And so what they would do would, would cause failure. And what they had to do was they had to write down their feelings and their thoughts. Guess what the results were? They found that people in the happy room had three times more depressive and dark thoughts than those in the bare room. Isn't that interesting? Because they have this pressure, this pressure of to be happy. And when they fail, they shouldn't feel this dark, depressive thought. And so from this conclusion, th these people, that they believe that the underlying factor of depression was that our coach places too much uh, focus on happiness. And I, as, as I read that, I actually caught up a friend um, probably a day after, and he himself has openly struggled with depression. And there was one thing he said, and I just, it just like, okay, God, I think you're, you're speaking here. He says, all I want is to feel happy because I see how everyone else is happy. Interesting. Could this be our false Eden? our society's pursuit of happiness. I only want to do things that make me happy. If I don't feel like it, I won't do it. What are you wanting to feel like? Happy. People are leaving jobs. You know, you think about, uh, they call it the great resignation. Why are people leaving jobs? Why are people leaving their marriages? Why are people changing genders? Why are people uh, doing these crazy things? Because they want to be happy. They're pursuing happiness. How do you think it's going? How do you think, it, how do you think the West is going with this pursuit of happiness? And can I tell you that, you know, Australia... Uh, you know, there are laws changing. There are many countries that have changed laws 20 years ago. And you know what studies have shown? That their mental health has actually got worse from changing those laws. So quite clearly, this pursuit of happiness is not helping. It's not working for the West. And what blows my mind is we're seeing governments making strange decisions to pursue this happiness and changing laws that not even science backs up. I thought this society was a science-backed society. Quite clearly, it's not. It's, it's actually a, a pursuit of happiness that they want. And I guess this is what happens. This is the mess that happens when society tries to create their own Eden without a king. No matter how promising an idea sounds, if God is not in it, you don't want to be in it either. Now, as we see over history, if you try to stand against these movements, like Hitler, like Chairman Mao's, you will be crucified with a self-righteous vengeance. Isn't that interesting? 
Isn't that interesting? Because it makes me think of what our culture is like today. For those that stand up against the, these, these things that people are trying to do. Now, does this mean God doesn't want us to be happy? No, but depends on where the source of your happiness comes from. God or flesh. In fact, you know, I cannot find anywhere in the New Testament scripture where the pursuit of happiness is a theme. It's not there. Look for it and you will not find it. God cares more about our holiness than our happiness. I'll say that again. God cares more about our holiness than our happiness. And often we have to choose the opposite of what the flesh desires. And that's why we see repeated commands by Jesus to deny yourself, take up your cross. You know, even we see Paul say, you do not belong to yourself. You belong to the Father. This is actually taking the eyes off ourself. And, I, and I, I loved as I shared this, you know, I was, as I was sharing this this morning, um, one of the girls at our church wore this T-shirt and she hasn't worn it for three years. You just want to put it up, Naomi? I thought how, how hilarious that I was preaching about this this morning and, and she decides to wear that T-shirt today out of the three years she's had. I've never seen her, seen her wear it. I think God's trying to say something. I don't know if you can hear this, but I think God's trying to speak in this morning. How uh, tonight? Wow. We're... And so, how do we find this true joy and happiness? Well, it starts with dwelling under God's sovereignty. We will not find true joy if we don't dwell under His sovereignty, because only the Creator of Eden knows what the perfect Eden is. Only He will feel that heart's desire of eternity. And so I want to I want to dwell. Uh, I want us to um, really understand what dwelling under God's sovereignty means. And so I want to I want us to turn to Romans eleven and twelve if you've got your Bibles with you, because I think this will help us. Um, understand God's sovereignty. And, and Romans, for those I know, there's a lot of life comes last year decided to study Romans. Um, and just to give you a bit of context, because I think Romans is sometimes confuses uh, people's idea of God's sovereignty. Um, crucial note, Romans 11, uh, Paul to- is talking centrally to the Jews about Gentiles and how they find their place in God's plan. And what Paul is trying to say to the Jews which is the short answer, the way you find your place is through what? Repentance and faith. And then in Romans 11, 13, he talks to the Gentiles about Jews. And he also says to them, this is how you uh, find your place in God's plan. And what is the short answer? Repentance and faith. This is important because people think God's sovereignty is about control. It's not about control. God is not in control of your life. You control your life. You have free will. God's sovereignty means He's in charge, which is completely different to control. God is not an abuser. He gives us free will. And I'll I'll give you an example because I'm I'm a football coach and sometimes it's easy to relate in that sense. When I say in charge, for me as a a football coach, I'm in charge of my players. I lead them. I tell them how we're going to play. I'm telling them how we're going to beat the other team. But they have a choice. They have a free will. They can choose to listen to me or they can choose to do their own thing. And I have the power... I can't control and dictate what they do, but I do have the power to take them off the team. And God has the same power, but I don't puppeteer every move on the footy field. I mean, that would be great if I could do that. You know, make them robots. Now, this is important to understand because God is the perfect 
sovereign, you know, he, he is perfect in leading us. I'm not perfect. I get it wrong, but God is perfect and he's the perfect person that's going to lead his team and we want to be on that team and he will get it done with, with or without us. That's important to understand. It's, it's whether we want to jump on his team to beat the enemy because his team's always going to win. I mean, my team often wins as well, but But God is the perfect ruler. And we see this. We see this how he has this heart to gather his hands. But it's clear that it's up to us. It's clear that throughout Scripture we see Israel, that it was their choice to repent and have faith. And we see this with Jesus. Jesus makes it very clear in Matthew 23, verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often... I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Jesus says the Israelites were not willing. You know, that's the Jews were, uh, were so upset. Um, and that's what Romans is about. They were so upset that they were no longer the chosen people. And, and, and what Paul is trying to say, you weren't the chosen people, it was through repentance and faith. It was for repentance. We are all chosen. But you have a decision. Are you going to repent in faith and come under God's sovereignty? God is sovereign with or without us. And we see that when Israel, Israel was not willing to come under God's sovereignty, what happened? God used other nations to destroy Israel. Because we have free will. Uh, Josh uh, he sent me this in his message. He said, if you recognize his sovereignty and faith, he will craft you according to his plan. If you refuse to recognize his sovereignty, rebelling against him, he will craft you according to his plan. God will, even though that we at times rebel against him, God can still reuse that as we come back in repentance and faith. He does not puppeteer us. And so as Christians, we have a choice to dwell under God's sovereignty daily. And we need to choose to do this daily. But let's, let's start with the, uh, Romans 11, verse 33. And it says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable His judgments and His past beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord who has been his counsellor, whoever's given to God, that God should repay them. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I just want you to catch this because often we just go straight to Romans 12. You know, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. And we miss this, this part because this is important because at the start of uh, Romans 12, 1, it says, Therefore, Whenever you see a therefore, you need to go back and read the full context of what's going on. Because this is important. We need to catch that everything, I mean everything in this passage, uh, comes from, from God, the good one. His wisdom and his knowledge is far beyond whatever, uh, you know, we, we, whatever social trend or uh, intellectual justification uh, that they may be offering. His judgments are greater. His mind is higher. His counsel is perfect. His depth is so great. We have nothing. I'm saying we have nothing to offer him. And then he says in Romans 12, therefore, therefore, we can't offer anything to God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I think this is important that we need to have the view of God's mercy. What is God's mercy? God shows compassion on us, even though that He could destroy us. Even though we deserve 
destruction. We deserve because of our rebellious towards God, but instead He shows mercy. And this is important that when we view the world, we should be viewing from that mercy place. We're very quick to judge people. But we've got to understand that God has shown us mercy first. He's given us an opportunity to come into His kingdom. In light of that, in view of God's mercy, He says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, pleasing to God. You know, this is true worship. That's what it says. This is uh, where we see true and proper worship. You know, worship on the stage, it's great. But that is not the true worship. That's part of worship. The true worship is when you are going into the world and you're offering yourself as a living sacrifice, pleasing to God. That is the true worship. When you're saying no to the world. And can I tell you, this hurts at times. It's not easy. And, and we see when people see the world, they want the world's recognition. And this, this happened around Jesus' time. It happens all the time. You know, we see it in John 12, 42, how he talks about the Jewish leaders who started believing in Jesus. But then John says, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. The question is, what do you desire more? Do you desire human praise or do you desire God and His praise? Because when we choose God, that is going to be a sacrifice. And it's not an easy thing to do. But this is where our identity is going to be drawn from. This is where we're going to find our true place. This is what we were created for. The Creator created us for Him. He's our true Father. Let's continue. In the view of God's mercy, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Do you know, I, I love this, and I'm sure many of you have stuck this up around uh, your room, and it's a verse that we can all probably remember. Do you know we all conform to something? The question is, are we conforming to God or are we conforming to the world? And I, 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 I just wanted to um, just read it in the message version. Now, I'm not a, a big supporter of the message, but I love how he can sometimes draw something um, out of the text. And what he does, um, Eugene Peterson, he says this in Romans 12 in the message where he says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Aren't we seeing this happen with Christians today? You know, I, I think, and I agree with what Josh is saying, that as believers, you know, there are things that we should hate that the world does. Now, it doesn't mean we hate the people. It's saying that we should be, there's something in us, that because God doesn't like it. And there is good hate. And, and when we hate something, we will resist it. But unfortunately, there are too many Christians that don't hate it, and they start to be like it, or they start to, to please their flesh. But I, I think as, as we come under God's uh, sovereignty, as we come to conform in His ways, we'll start not liking the worldly things because we know it doesn't please the heart's desire. It won't fulfill it. And so we need to be careful that we are not conforming to the world, but we are starting to conform to God and we need to start abiding in His Word. We need to start to encourage each other to let the Spirit flow within us. Um, we need to come around worship. We need to, uh, yeah, just keep people on the narrow road. It's not an easy road, but we need to keep people 
on the narrow path because we can so easily get off it. And unfortunately, the sad thing is we are seeing many Christians fall off that road and take on this pursuit of happiness and bring it into Christianity. Because they say, well, they're happy, so there must be nothing wrong with it. Can I tell you, God cares more about holiness than happiness. My third point, in God's mercy, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do you know, I think there are many Christians that are getting confused with what is God's will for my life. I think that question that you ask is confusing if you're not all in. If you're not under God's sovereignty. Because when we come and conform to God, it says He will renew our mind and then He says, you will know His good and perfect will. It shouldn't be confusing. Only if you're not all in with God. Only if you're not under His sovereignty, that question's confusing to you. Now, I understand for those that are new believers in the room, you're, you're just starting the journey. You're just starting to understand God. And and as you pursue God, He is renewing your mind to become like God, like thinking like God. And so I can understand that question can be, but if you're a mature believer here and you've been a mature believer for a long time and you're still asking that question, maybe you've still got your foot in the world. And that's a hard thing to, to hear, but maybe you're not all in. Maybe you're conforming still to the world's patterns. Because Scripture is very clear here, when you conform to God, you will know His perfect will. Does that make sense? And so I want to ask you, are you offering your whole life, every moment, every opportunity to the King? Because when you do, you'll realize God's will. Now, I just, I just want to, it's hard. This world we live in, this pursuit of happiness is a hard thing. And, and I'm seeing many believers that are close friends that are, are falling into that trap of trying to please the world. And like I said, you know, we're going we're gonna, to, when we stand against these movements, People are going to be angry with us. But I want to encourage you that one day, one day you will look back and you go, thank God I was the Dietrich Bonhoeffer that stood against Hitler. You know, thank God for the Christians that stood against Chairman Mao's, you know, regime. Because can I tell you, there wasn't many. There were some, but there weren't many. And I'm going to ask you the question, are you going to be that one that stands against today's movement of pursuit of happiness? I'm not saying it's going to be an easy thing. In fact, you're going to have people that are close to you that's going to turn on you. They're going to be angry with you. But we are not here to please them. We're here to come under God's sovereignty, to dwell under Him, because we know, we know that there will be a day where there is no sin, where there is no brokenness. There will be no division. And that day is when God will fully restore the earth to what it originally was created for. And the question is, are you going to be part of that day? Because I want to be. And I know that That is the only place that I'm going to find my place. That's what I am created for, is being under His sovereignty. And so I understand that, you know, ANU is not an easy place. 
But God's called us to be there. And God has called us to speak truth because you know what? This pursuit of happiness is not helping people. In fact, the study says it's making it worse. And we know the only thing that's going to be the light is God. We know the only way that's going to draw them out of that depressive state is God. Only God is going to fill that hole in that heart of theirs. And so I want to encourage you to pick up your cross. And let's face this world as the church. Are you with me? Father God, I just thank you uh, for this community, the City PM, that have decided to, to face this world head on. We know that your will is perfect, God. We know that your plan is perfect. And Father, you desire for us to come in, into your will, to come under your sovereign hands. And, we, and when we do that, Father, we know that, you know, you will transform us. Father, that, that's when we will finally, you know, find our place, a place where we belong, because that's what we were created for, is to be under you. And so I just pray, Father, that this church would embrace being under your sovereign hand, that they would embrace uh, living for you and take up their cross and, and speak against this movement of, of, of happiness, this pursuit of happiness is not making people happy. And I pray that we would just speak life, speak truth, you know, and we, and we would just speak it with grace and mercy with your, your mercy in, in the front of our minds. In Jesus' name, amen.